Welcome to a training course in a unit trust or how to build a unit trust deed. Now, there are a number of types of trusts under Australian law and unit trust is probably the second most populous or most popular trust you can uh, have. The most popular trust, of course, is the family discretionary trust and we have a training video on that for you. But today we're going to look at unit trust. So let's just have a look at the difference between say a, a family trust and a unit trust. So a family trust has many beneficiaries, thousands of beneficiaries. A unit trust has fixed unit holders of which there might be one, might be up to say 50, more than that you become a, you start getting taxed differently. So there's a family trust, there's a unit trust. Now, this unit holder has a fixed entitlement. Let's say they've got 10 shares. This unit holder might have, say, 20 shares. This unit holder might be a family trust, and this unit holder may be a company, and they might have 10 units each. So what's that? You've got 50 units. So if you, had, if you owned the whole 50 units, you'd own 100% of the assets of the unit trust, if you own 10, 10 units, well, you own 20%. If you own 20, you own 40% in, in this instance. So you can see these are fixed entitlements. Now, when a family trust, this is just good for a mum and dad. There's an appointor, there's a trustee, because mum and dad, as the appointors, can have different beneficiaries get different assets every year. So these people, you know, your kids, your children, your grandparents, they're all just squash cabbage leaves. They've got no rights. But over here with the unit holders, they have fixed entitlements, just like a company. So here's a company. It's very similar to a unit trust. And in this company, there's 10 shares, 20, 10, and 10. So you can see that this is a fixed entitlement. So if this unit trust was to make $100 profit, then $20 has to go here, $40 here, $20 here, and $20 there. It's fixed. You cannot get, you cannot change it. Obviously, you can pay your directors um, lots of money. You can have contractors out here getting paid money. You've got staff, you paid money. But whatever the profit is, if the unit trust decides to distribute it, and it normally does, then it will be paid exactly in these proportions. And this is why they're kind of useful. If you've got four, four people that are not mum and dads, then they want to make sure that they guarantee their, their amounts of money. So that's the family trust, and that's the unit trust. There are other types of trusts as well called bear trusts. So there's your family trust. There's your unit trust. There's also some other types of trusts called bear trusts. And the four most common ones are, well, the most common ones are declaration of trust before you buy. So in this instance, you own seven flats and the eighth one has just come on the market and the guy knows that you're going to want to buy it because you want to own all eight so you can subdivide it or knock it down or do what you want to do. So the guy puts the price on very high for the eighth flat in that block of flats. But some other one, some other other person turns up, maybe one of your friends. What's your friend's name? John Smith. So, John Smith, you do this before you before you make the offer. You build one of these documents called a declaration of trust before you purchase, and then John Smith, who's not known to the vendor, he makes an offer to buy, and once it's bought, you are the beneficial owner. And this is the very essence of trusts. To have a trust, you need to have a trustee and a beneficiary and an asset in the trust. For those of my students that I've lectured, you know that that is the corpus, but it's just an asset in the trust. So that's a declaration before you buy. They're bare trusts, and you can then transfer the asset either before settlement or after settlement into the name of the beneficial owner, which is you, for no stamp to your CGT in most jurisdictions. That's the Declaration of Trust. That's a very common document. The next one is a gifting trust. This is what you do the day before you die. 
and you will hold the assets in trust for your mistress, say. So you might well have um, a lazy property somewhere and you say, I now hold this property in trust for my oldest son. At that point, the assets transferred beneficially to your son, but you remain the legal owner. Lots of stamp due to capital gains tax, but certainly stops the will being challenged. The other type of trust is a bear trust. This is when you're just trying to hide assets, not from the Australian Taxation Office and not from a government regulator, but just from a Channel 7 news crew and not from the family court either because you've got to disclose these assets. So if, for example, I'm a bit sick and tired, I'm a, a very famous cricketer, and I'm very sick and tired of Channel 7 news crew doing searches at the titles office in Sydney to see what assets I own or the properties I own. So what I do, I transfer these properties from my name into the name of someone else, but I keep the beneficial ownership. There's generally no stamps of your CGT on that, on that transaction. That's called a, a bear trust. So it's just basically hiding assets, but not from government regulators or from, the fa from a court. It's also very useful. A bear trust is, it has been in the past, not so much now, but useful for when people want to sue you. So when I, when my clients decide to sue someone, we do two checks. One, if we went to court, would we win? And if we did win, would we have some money to, would the guy was suing some money? So a client will come to us and say, Brett, is it worthwhile suing someone? Well, you're going to win in court? Good. Does a guy have any assets? Well, to do that, we would have, what we would do is we would check, thanks for that. What we would do is we would merely check to see whether there's any assets in the, in the titles office. And then the final one, and the most problematic one, is the acknowledgement of trust deed. This is when you made a mistake and you quickly gave some money to your oldest, to one of your daughters, and she went out and bought this asset in her name, but the true owner is you. Or you bought something for yourself and it's super fun, but somehow it got in the wrong name, or there's been a muck up. Now this is bad. But this is what you do, you do acknowledgement of trust, then you make, then you can seek a private rule from the ATO and give it to the stamps office. They're called bear trust because there's no discretion as to those, those trusts. They're just being held by a certain person. So you've got those four bear trusts, you've got family trusts, but we're very interested in unit trusts. Now the other type of documents around unit trust is the unit trust deed itself, which we're going to go through. A vesting deed, which is when you want to wind up the unit trust. Usually, when you form a company trust, you'd normally build a company first to be the trustee of the unit trust. We'll come to that. And at some point in time, you might, may want to change the trustee of unit trust, which you can generally do for no stamp duty, no transfer duty, and no capital gains tax. You can change the name of unit trust, because quite often you make a mistake coming up with some funny names, B sharps or whatever, and it doesn't seem to ring so true after a couple of years, you can change the name. And then there's a unit holders agreement, which is common so that everyone's, if there's something happens, someone goes bankrupt, you can actually go in and buy, buy the units off the bankrupt person. But today we are going to look at a unit trust deed. So you don't necessarily have a trust, you don't necessarily have to have a trust deed. So, for example, your child, first child is born and you decide to have uh, put $100 into Westpac bank account in trust for that child. So you're the mum, you're the trustee, and the little baby boy, little baby boy you've got is the beneficiary. There's a trust. So you need three things in a trust. You need the trustee, you need a beneficiary, and you need the corpus, the, an asset. Well, I've got them. I've got all three. I, I don't even have any, I don't even have a deed. But I do have some evidence, because in the Australian Taxation Office will tax the baby, not you, because the, the ATO, under Australian law, the beneficial owners are generally taxed, not generally the, tr the bare trustees or the trustees, generally the, I know that, I know, uh, section 99A, but forget about that for a moment. Generally, the beneficiaries are the guys that are getting taxed. 
and the corpus is the hundred dollars. Eighteen years now pass, and your daughter walks into the bank and says, I want you to transfer lickety split, I don't want to muck around here, that hundred dollars into plus the interest. Not as much interest these days, but plus the interest into my name. It's currently my mum's name. I'm going to transfer it to my name. Now, if you don't do that, I will go to the court and I will sue you for it. And you'll have to pay all the costs because I'm the beneficial owner of this asset. So the bank will transfer the legal ownership because the beneficial ownership is always the daughter. Mum's the trustee. The asset is transferred. The bank account's name is changed to the daughter's name. The trust is now dissolved. Why? Because to be a trust, you have to have three things. A trustee, a beneficiary, and, and an asset. But no longer do you have a trustee and beneficiary, and they're now one of the same, which means the daughter is now both the legal owner and the beneficial owner. Now, in trust law, it was developed uh, the uh, Battle of Normandy in England, but also confirmed by King Henry VIII, the courts of chancery. So this is ancient trusts, and laws related to trust to ancient English law, which the Australian government and the Australian common law has adopted. But to have a unit trust, you are best to have a trust, where well, you've got to have a trustee. And I'm going to build one here. So you are now on a law firm's website. We're the only law firm in Australia to provide legal documents on our website. You can build documents on a non-law firm website, but just be very careful um, by doing that. So let's have a look at the terms that you're using. So be very careful that you are using a lawyer. So getting legal documents from a website, those documents, Legal Solidarity is responsible for those documents. We're a law firm. You ring up our, you ring us up now, you'll speak to a lawyer because we're a law firm. There is a direct client relation between your, between us and the client. So if you're an accountant, financial advisor or lawyer building a document on our website, the letter is prepared. You'll get a letter with every single one of the documents built on our website, a letter to your client stating we authored the document, not you. You're just a mere scribe. Now, other law firms, some law firms provide templates to non-law firms. So it's a reselling of a law firm's template. Well, I'm afraid there's no, no protection, no responsibility by the original law firm that provided that template. That's not the case of Legal Consolidator. We're responsible. We have a direct relationship with, with your client or with you if you, if you are a mum and dad building the document on our website. Now, I can see a sample of this document. And I can also see the questions are going to be asked. So before I start building this document, I can actually see what I'm going to have. So there's a document, there's a, the unit trust deed, some hints all the way through it. This is just a sample document. If as you build your own unit trust deed for yourself or for your client, it will be different depending on how you answer, depending on how you answer the questions. And there it is. Every single one of our Documents. Every single one of our documents, we've got over 380 documents you can build on our legal documents, you can build on our website, all have a covering letter. Thank you for building your unit holders agreement. Checklist. These are the questions that are going to be asked, but I'm going to start building the document. Before I do, I can read up a number of things. Maybe I'm not sure whether you're a family trust or a unit trust. If it's just mum and dad, you're probably okay with the family trust. If it's you and your wife and your son, you probably need a unit trust because your son's second wife or his current mistress may well decide to uh, that she wants rights and privileges. So if you have more than 50 unit holders, there's a few issues with that. You know, the tax on a unit trust is uh, is different. So let's have a look at the at the trust tax rules. So what happens is that the trustee will hold the assets, so they're, they're the assets there, so it's a block of flats in Double Bay in Sydney, and that will have, uh, may have rent of say one a million 
Aussie dollars a year, and that'll be distributed to the unit holders. Let's say there's two, and they hold 50% each. Now, there's no tax taken out of this one million. It goes straight to this guy here. He picks up half a brick, half a million dollars. And that unit holder, and it could be a company, it could be a mum, it could be a dad, it could be a mum and dad, it could be and probably more likely to be a family trust, they get it and they deal with the taxation of it under their own, own income tax amount. So the unit trust doesn't pay tax on that $1 million provided it distributes the income. Well, there's a present entitlement to be distributed to the, to the unit holders. If the unit trust forgets or decides not to make a distribution, then under section 99A of the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936, then the trustee does have to pay tax at the highest marginal tax rate which is something it doesn't really want to do. So normally you will distribute out of the trust. It's interesting because in a company, the, the tax is paid by the company, so the tax rates, um, 30%. Then you can keep hoarding money. There's a million dollars there, $300,000 is paid in tax, and you can park the money in the company. That's not an opportunity which you have in a, in a unit trust. But the advantage of a unit trust is you don't get taxed in the vehicle. It goes straight down and the tax is dealt with by the unit holders, where the shareholders in the company, they're getting imputation credits. So, you know, there's pros and cons. That's when you talk about, talk to your accountant about why one's better than the other. There's also a 50% capital gains tax. If you sell an asset from a trust, you get massive CGT relief. It's much harder to get capital gains tax relief when you sell an asset out of a company. In fact, I would say it's almost, it's almost impossible. So we are going to continue on. What else is in this introduction page? Can a unit trust last forever? But they can only last 80 years. In South Australia, we are allowed to do it a lot longer, but I don't think it helps much because anyone in South Australia can make the decision to wind up the unit trust after 80 years. So I've pressed start building. Now, I membership, basic standard membership to our website is free. And I will now log. So I'm starting to build my unit trust on our law firm's website. I have done many other documents for our clients over many years, and I could actually pick up data from one of them. So I might have done um, a family trust deed for one of my clients, and if I wished, I could pick up that data, and that would put it into this unit trust deed. But I'm going to start the unit trust from scratch. And here it is. I can see here I'm going to be asked questions about trust name, who the trustees are, who the units and unit holders are, and a reference and summary. And if everything, if I get green ticks on all of these, then our law firm will allow you to see the lock and build. And at that point, you can press lock and build, put your credit card details in, and within a few seconds, the document and our covering letter and the minutes and all the other, all the other things you need for a unit trustee will be there. Now, I don't know what I should call my trust. So let's have a look here. So are unit holders liable for unit trust debts? Um, what's the difference between a family trust and a unit trust? The difference between a company unit trust? So here, there's hints all the way through. Now, the word the and trust are already in the document. I'm going to call my trust after my wife's name, Angelina and Professor Davies. I'm going to call it Unit Trust. So that's my name. Now, of course, the most common name for a unit trust in Australia, and all accountants will be snarling with this, is the Smith Unit Trust, because there's a lot of Smiths, and therefore you often call it after your surname. So you can see that 
the trust name, like a family trust name, is not a proprietary business name. It's just a nickname. It's a nickname which you can use. So there's thousands of, of Davies unit trusts. There's thousands of Smith unit trusts. But I'm going to call it that name. I get lots of hints. So you can see here that any time you can call, you can ring up, speak to any of the lawyers here. This is interesting. This this issue about unit holders being liable. So asset protection asset protection is a really important issue. You want to make sure that a lawyer is preparing a unit trustee because under Broomhead Proprietary Limited, they were liable. When, the, when their unit trust went down, the unit holders were liable. And it's very important that the unit trust be drafted so that you're not liable when the unit trust goes down. Very important. So I wouldn't be mucking around with some reseller or non-law firm reselling a, a lawyer's unit trust deed. Now, I'm not going to press next. I hate, I hate rules. I'm going to just go straight down to trust deed. Oh, green tick. That green tick's good because it means that as far as a law firm is concerned, I've answered it sufficiently. Now, with this trustee, I have formed a company on our law firm's website yesterday, and it was checked by one of the lawyers at Legal Consolidated, and I'm going to call it um, Yasua, the Pryach Limited. Australian company number is what every Australian company is given. I like, I kind of like companies as trustee of the unit trusts. Look, I know under Australian law, if you're a director of a company and the company goes down, then you probably go down with it. And I know the Australian Taxation Office have huge, um, huge things it can do against directors. I know all that, but it's like, uh, as my 14 year old son says, it's like firewalls. A, a company, moves you one step away from the risks of this unit trust. And this unit trust may be holding property or or maybe running a business. They're all they're all things that could could uh, end up being insolvency. So I kind of like a company there. Telephone number, email. So put the address in. And I've got a green tick. Now, this time I'm going to press next. The value of the units, I'm going to make them, I'm going to make them, I'm going to make them um, zero, no, I'm going to make them one dollar each. I can make them anything I want. I could make them 0 0.001 cent, depends. And the first unit holder is me, is Brett. Kenneth Davies. And I'm going to make sure that I hold a hundred units. I hold those units in trust for the Davies Family Trust, which is pretty common. Now, the other unit holder, I could have one unit holder, the other unit holder is my good friend. And my good friend's name is... So this time, the second unit holder will be a company called my mate or my um, business friend, Private Limited, and uh, yeah, the company is ACN's that one. Telephone number, email address, they you know, live at 1 Collins Street in Melbourne. And now the unit value is always going to be $1 each because everyone's got to have the same, to begin with, the same $1 units. You can issue a lot units of different amounts at another, another time. And I have got, how many units do I have? A hundred? Well, this person wants 200. 
That means I'll only have a third interest in it, and they hold the uh, unit. They hold these units beneficially in their own name. So the, the company itself owns the unit. So the company doesn't hold it in trust for anyone. So I've got my two unit holders, and there's my green tick. I'm there. Press next. Now the reference is just more. If you're a financial advisor, accountant, lawyer, and you've got two thousand clients, you want to issue. You might want to put their um, reference number in. So the um, solicitor of conduct of the matter, the client's name, Smith, whatever it is, you put that there. So in five or six or twenty years' time, you can log back in and see the unit trust you did for that particular client. Select this box, you want your business logo to go on the document? Of course I do. I want, I'm an accountant. Let's say I'm an accountant. I'd like my accounting logo right next to the legal consolidated logo. So in 20 years time, people are coming back to my accounting house. Select the box, remove legal consolidated's logo. Only do that if you're a lawyer. Do not take it off unless you're a lawyer. Select the box to print, bind and post. I won't need that. I've got my own printer. Select the box, one of our lawyers will telephone us. Now that's kind of useful if it was, um, Perhaps in a three generational test with trust will. For this instance, I don't really need my uh, clients. I don't need to have someone go through that document. Now there's the green tick. Press next. And now I see lock and build. If you see lock and build, we are happy. Legal consolidator, barristers and solicitors is happy with the document. You're ready to build it. But you also should check to see that the correct spelling is all here, and it looks good. I'm happy with that. So I'm going to press lock and build. I want to put my credit card, my credit card details in. So I've paid for the document, and it's been accepted. And there's I can actually telephone the law firm. Picture of uh, Professor Brett Davies. So the document's normally um, normally built within about 30 seconds. And this will be kept in, in your documents file forever, forever. And also the data. So if I want to use the data to build another document, I can do so. There's the data, but I'm interested in the locked PDF. Um, sorry, Professor David, did you say locked PDF? We may want to change it. No, you can't change it. We're the law firm. We've just built it for you. If you want to do something or change it, telephone us. You can't change a legal document. It's a deed. I don't know how many we sold of these last year. It's a 10 or 15,000 of them. You cannot change them. They're a lot PDF because we are responsible. Legal consolidators are responsible for the document. Now, if you've made a mistake, you need to change the spelling of something, just email us. We'll send you a voucher to update the document. But you can't change it. It's a ridiculous situation. So, I've built the document, I've answered the questions, and now here is the letter on law firm letterhead. Let's read the first thing. Thank you for instructing us to prepare the attached unit trust. We've written this as our law firm directly to your client. We are responsible for this document, not you the mere scribe. And here it is. Dear trustee, thank you for instructing us to prepare the attached unit trust deed, how to print it how to store it, get the tax file number the and, and ABNs or whatever else you need to do if you need to register it. All that's free. So there's a covering letter. After the covering letter, you will get minutes. There's the minutes that are required under, under the laws to establish, to establish the unit trust. And here it is. Oh, nice logo. The logo next to our law firm's letterhead. And there's a unit trust for the Angelina and Professor Davies unit trust. There's a unit holders. This guy got a hundred units of dollar each. No, I got a hundred units. And the other guy I'm in business we've got two hundred. So I've got about a, I've got exactly a third of the company. And there it all is. So the dictionary with a set of rules. Market value in case units ever ever need to be sold. The definition of net income. Big issue with this. Big issue. So we allow you as the trustee, if the unit holders 
determined to change the definition of net income. So if the Australian Taxation Office comes up with another Banford case or another big issue, then you don't need to update this trustee for net income. You can just buy, buy uh, the trustee by minute can change the definition of net income. Accountants love that and we're the only law firm in Australia to provide that in unit in um, in a unit trust deed, which is why this is the biggest selling unit trust in Australia. Special resolution for the big important questions. The trustee can change. So you can the system allows the tra chaining of the trustees, generally without any, any stamp duty, transfer duty or capital gains tax. The vesting date upon the vesting date, but if you're in South Australia, so 80 years minus one day or earlier date the trustee may appoint. Now, what's happened recently with some insolvency matters is that there's been an argument from trustees in bankruptcy, my arch enemies. There's a, I have two enemies, the Australian Taxation Office that are attacking my clients and insolvency practitioners that are attacking my clients. So there's the war. And we've got to make sure that we're protecting you as the client. Now, one of these issues that we're attacked on by insolvency practitioners is they will argue that the unit holders themselves are in a partnership relationship. This is a very strange argument that seems to be getting up. So that the unit holders are so much together that they're in a partnership. A bizarre argument. But in order to stop that from being argued for the legal consolidated unit trust deeds, we put in clause four, there is no partnership relationship, a unique advantage of a legal consolidated unit trustee. Trustee and bankruptcies don't like it. It protects you as the client. Now, this is the broomhead situation where if the unit trust goes down, the unit holders will often go down with it. Clause five stops that straight out of the high court authority. Most good unit trustees prepared by lawyers should have that similar clauses there. Unit trusts are divided into units. Um, the unit price can change. So now, if you build up value in that, you want a third business partner coming in, or well, you can issue a lot units at, at $500 each or $0.10 cents each, whatever, whatever the uh, unit holders decide. There'll be a, a register on, of the unit holders, which you'll see a little bit later as we move towards the end of this document. And um, we had this recently where um, <laughs> another law firm's uh, a client came to us, an accountant came to us, and with a, someone else's unit trustee, and they'd lost a certificate. And there was no, no um, methodology in the unit trustee to issue um, more certificates if they're lost. Just bizarre. You've got to, if you're a lawyer, practice in what you practice. Now, we do a lot of trust law here. You only do stuff you're good at. That's my advice as a lawyer. If you're good at family law, don't get involved in unit trust deeds. How to transfer the units. So, again, you don't necessarily want your biggest competitor buying a 5% interest in your unit trust. So, one of the small unit holders may want to sell out. So, there's opportunities there. A bit like preemptive rights in companies. They've got to be offered back to the other unit holders. Very important to protect you. Death, now my, my PhD was on succession planning and I authored two main textbooks on estate planning. Death is a big, uh, big issue that needs to be dealt with in a very effective and tax friendly manner. This clause allows that to do that. There's more procedures on your preemptive rights so that if someone does die or wants to sell the units, I've got to go be offered back to the unit holders first. And there's a rules there which are fair to both sides of the party. Now, in a company, it's extremely difficult to cancel shares and it's very difficult for the company to buy back shares in itself. The largest piece of legislation in Australia is the Income Tax Assessment Act, but the second largest piece of legislation in Australia is the Corporations Law. And a company is controlled by the Corporations Act. And I don't like that. I don't like regulation. I like unit trust because 
you do whatever you jolly well want to do in a unit trust, a family trust or bear trust. There's no rules and regulations. You make up your own rules. These are the rules of your unit trust. With a company, it's over-regulated by bureaucrats at the a at ASIC. And ASIC will dominate a lot of the rules. So with a company, you do have a constitution. I accept that. You can have shareholders agreements. You can build both constitutions and shareholders agreements on our website. But they're so overly regulated companies. Unit trusts are just much more fun. You can do a lot more with them. One of those is you can actually buy back the unit holder can sell the units actually back to the unit trust. It's just a wonderful advantage over uh, over companies. Yes, companies can have buybacks, but they're a lot more complicated. Um, the valuation of units. Again, you can amend this unit trust deed by an exchange of emails, which is another unique advantage of a legal consolidated unit trust deed. You can do it by by uh, an exchange of emails. What happens if the trust ends, the debts, the net income? A lot of this is very driven by the latest rulings from the Australian Taxation Office. Uh, another advantage, with a company, you've got to be very careful in the payment of dividends and also the release of capital out of the company. There's a whole lot of very draconian rules. But no such rules in unit trusts. You pretty much do whatever you want to do. And our unit, unit, our unit trust does not get in the way of that. Beautifully drafted for you to be able to manipulate your assets in the unit trust as you, you and your fellow unit holders decide. Now, a human being, a human, can invest in whatever they want to, but trustees can only invest according to the local state trustees act or as the rules allow the trustees. So obviously you want to allow the greatest opportunity to invest in whatever you jolly well want to invest in. You don't want any restrictions there. And so our company constitutions and our unit holders and our family trustees all allow the maximum number of of opportunities to invest in as you see fit. So here we're overriding the Trustees Act of New South Wales and um, Northern Territory and Tasmania. So more things that this unit trust can invest in. We pretty much make it as wide as we possibly can now, this, I first drafted this unit trust uh, in 1988, and it's been added to over, over the years to be as wide as possible. You can waste the assets, you can do, provided the unit holders acting together, you can do whatever you want to do with the assets. Further powers of investment. Banks require these too. So when you, if, if the unit trust to borrow money from the bank, they require a lot of these clauses to provide guarantees, those sorts of things. Trustees can delegate. Trustees take a holiday. They can. Very clearly set out. We not only are these documents pure geniuses of tax and trust law, but also draft in the way to make it straightforward for you to understand. Again, trying to, the Broomheads case, trying to make sure you're not personally liable. Trustees can get paid or not get paid as you see fit. Can trustees charge a fee? So if you're, um, if you happen to be a financial advisor, accountant, lawyer, you can still continue to charge a fee. The removal of trustees is a big issue, particularly if the trustee goes hostile. The preparation of books to make sure it complies with Australian accounting standards to allow your accountant to make sure they uh, are fully empowered to deal with the, uh, the tax and the uh, trust returns. The variation of the trust deed, provided you've got a setting 5% of the, of the people there, of the unit holders, you can change it. Discretionary trust units, this is a bit like having a family trust. 
Obviously, they're reduced if a, un if a SOP and its super fund. So these are quite often used for SOP and its super funds to co-invest. There it is. Superannuation funds are not entitled to use the par units to give any income because that would be against the uh, CIS regulations to do so. Control of the meetings. The chairmanship. So everything's set out so you can actually run your business and it's designed just in case something goes, if you're starting to fight with your fellow unit holders, these rules will come into play. So they're sitting in your bottom drawer and they're used when people start fighting. And this is when you really want to have a proper unit trustee. So who signed it? The trustee has signed it. There's um, the family trust has signed it. Well, myself as, as trustee of my family trust and my my business friend, his company, has also signed it. So that's the trust deed. These are the certificates. So you just print these off and complete them and write them in every time you buy or sell a, every time you buy or sell a unit. There's a transfer form. So we've, we've got another situation with this, uh, another law firm's unit trust deed there. They actually, it's quite old and they actually want to transfer some units and there's no uh, transfer form and, no, and there's no rules and regulations on it. This is fully compliant. There's a unit holder register. It's a bit like a company in the sense that these, all these things go in the, in the secretarial file for unit trusts. Proxy form for meetings, everything's here. So if you can't attend, you can actually proxy. It's an issue on allotting more units. And there's the, the pro forma minutes to transfer. So whatever your accountant needs is pretty much in this unit trust. And if we found any way to improve the unit trust, we would do so. This is, this is the absolute cutting edge opportunities that are available to you if you want to form a unit in a trust. If you have any questions as you build the document, as you start building the unit trust here, you can telephone our law firm or you can actually do a chat with us as well and you'll speak to one of the lawyers here and we can take you through the drafting of it. So if you can, you need any help or advice on anything, you can just, just telephone us or chat with us or email us. I hope you have enjoyed this training course on unit trustees. While there's many trusts available in Australia, the most common one is the family trust. That's only good for a mum and dad. The next one is the unit trust, and that's how most people operate if they're operating outside of their of their immediate family. Enjoy this beautiful, beautiful document and telephone us if you need a hand building it. Enjoy.